Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar series, Cranert On. I'm Tim Newton, Director of External Relations for the Cranert School of Management. This webinar is titled Career Development, the Big Four. It will focus on resume writing, interviewing, networking, and career strategy. Today's webinar is being conducted by Roger Stewart. Roger is a Purdue graduate who spent 30 years at Procter & Gamble. He retired there as Vice President of Global Treasury. Roger is now the Director of Career Services at the Cranert School. He's also taught in the finance area at Cranert. We'll pause a few times during the discussion to give Roger a chance to answer some of your questions. Please feel free to submit your questions during the presentation. You can go that by going by going to uh, do that by going to the Q&A box at the bottom left-hand side and typing in your questions there, and then we will bring those up and ask those as we go along. So, Roger, thank you for joining us, and I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Tim, thank you very much. Um, I'm really looking forward to the opportunity for talking with friends of the Cranert School and Purdue University this afternoon. Uh, for all of those of you on the uh, online who are students or alumni, let me tell you there is no bigger reward or honor than to return to West Lafayette and Cranert to be a part of the program. So if you have the opportunity, uh, I would encourage you to do so because I can't tell you how rewarding it has been for me personally. What I want to talk to you today about is, as Tim mentioned, what we call in career services the big four. And those are resume writing, interviewing skills, developing your career strategy, and developing a networking plan. While we work on those oh, quite a bit with all of the students here, what we teach them is that these are lifetime skills. And so hopefully what we're going to be talking about today will also be very valuable to you. The one other thing I would say as we talk about this is I'm going to focus most of my attention on the latter two, career strategy and networking. Uh, the resume, I believe, are a lot of you would be up to date, and I'll only touch upon that. And it's probably not needed for me to spend a lot of time on the interview because we had a previous webinar on that handled by Tom McDuffie and Jill Mullins. Uh, once again, I would encourage you to uh, let me know if you have any questions throughout the presentation or comments from your perspective in industry or in the classroom or whatever that might be because I can always learn something from talking to those of you on the outside. So first, let me just touch very briefly on the resume and what I consider to be the key things that I look for when I review a student's resume. The first thing is, and this should feel to be very intuitive and obvious, but frequently it doesn't happen. Does your resume support your career objective and profile statement? A lot of us have a tendency to be so proud of our accomplishments or the responsibilities that we had that we are excited about getting them on the resume. But occasionally, what we are excited about or what may be most impressive in our previous career may not lead to the role that you're looking for. And so I would always encourage you, and as you have your resume reviewed by others, to make certain do the bullet points, your accomplishments, tie in where you are suggesting you would like to be going or the role that you are looking for. The other thing I would mention, and this is just a reminder, that as we review the bullet points, we always want to make certain that the STAR method is used, i.e., you describe the situation, you describe the task that you completed, or the task that was at hand, you describe the action that you took, and then you provide some information on the results. The other way we talk about this is with students is open up with an action verb, describe what you did, and then describe the outcome. Once again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the resume, but one point I believe is very important here, and I would suggest everyone challenge themselves to think about, is when you identify your results, if at all possible, without sharing proprietary information, 
put that on the resume. It's really nice to know that you created a major cost savings at your firm. But as a recruiter, I am much more happy to know that you saved a million bucks. Or if you say that working in the manufacturing facility, you reduce scrap rates, it's much more informative to me to know that you reduce scrap rate from 7% to 6%. And even if you can't provide a number, as much as you can fully describe the outcome on your resume, I believe that is helpful to the recruiter. And one final point on this before I move ahead, and that is this. Frequently I talk to people who say, well, I'm holding back a piece of information because I believe that will be particularly interesting in the interview. If you don't get the interview, you don't have the opportunity to describe that information to them. So I would encourage you not to think about holding stuff back. What you would want to do is hold back how you describe all of the good work that you've done. Now, as I said before, we've had a previous webinar on interviewing, so I won't spend a lot of time on it either. But what I do when students are in my office is I ask them just two or three of the typical interview questions, and I can listen to them typically only answer one of them, and at most two or three, and know whether or not they're prepared to interview. Questions like, what is your major strength? Describe for me your major development area. Give me an example of your most proud leadership example, so on and so forth. If those are so common, if a student can't answer those easily, or any, any person interviewing, then I know they are not prepared for the interview. Now, I don't want folks to get to the point that their answers sound uh, like it's a canned speech. But you really, on all of these major areas, describing your experience, what are your strengths, how did you deal with controversy at some earlier point in your career, if you have not thought broadly about the areas that you want to bring out in the interview, I would suggest you're not prepared. Now, one final point on this. We are using, uh, with the Krennert Master students, a product called Interview Stream, where they uh, are, get online and they are, record, uh, some, they are recorded answering a number of interviewing questions. And it's, it's, also, it's also done uh, with, a, with a camera at hand so we can see their body language and what they look like in the interview. What I really enjoy about this tool is that it's timed. And as I talk to students, and in fact I interviewed somebody for a job here at Cranert who has 20 years of career experience just in the past couple of days, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see made is people have a tendency to ramble. Uh, there's this natural tendency you get asked a question, you start talking right away, and after you've provided about four or five sentences, or maybe two to three minutes, then you begin to decide what you want to accomplish in the question. And my suggestion to everyone is, is when you get a question, just pause for two to three sentences and think, what is the outcome I want from this question? And what is the most efficient way for me to get there? And most importantly, every time I answer a question, what am I doing to market myself to the uh, recruiter? Um, the final thing I say to students in this area is if it takes you twice as long as it should to answer an interview question, you have missed the opportunity to share half of what you potentially could give to the recruiter. So think about that. You have a limited amount of time frequently if you're talking to someone recruiting you. And your objective is to share as much positive information about yourself as you possibly can in that period. And if you ramble, you're wasting time. And the worst thing that might happen is the recruiter might get bored and quit paying attention. Enough for interviewing. Career strategy. 
if I look back on my own personal career after working 30 years at Procter & Gamble, I would say that the way I differentiated myself from my peers was my ability to think three to five years down the road. You know, all of us have strengths. Some of us are particularly good managers. Somebody are particularly good analysts. Some of us are particularly good thinkers. But for me, my ability to think down the road is what drove my career more than anything else. And I believe strategy and thinking out front is equally important in your own career as it is in anything in your business, volunteer work you do with not-for-profit agencies, or whatever the case might be. So one of the things that we're starting in dealing with the master's students here at Cranert is we are having each of them document their own career strategy. And we're bringing an outside speaker in to coach, to coach to them about that, who is an executive recruiter. I've known this woman for about 20 or 25 years. And I believe she's absolutely the best in the business. Uh, if I were turning a staff over, I would be willing to have her pull together all the people on the staff, meet with them as a group for a half hour, and make certain my gut feel was all right, and I'd run with it. So she's going to come in and talk to the students and what we want them to do is to describe for us the role that they want to have five years from today. And then I want them to assess the lifestyle that they expect to have 10 years from now. And so let's talk about the two components in detail. We encourage the students here, and I would encourage you, whether you are a recent college grad you are in the middle of your career, or you're trying to think about what you want to be doing in retirement, to assess where do you stand today. So for perspective, when a student comes into the Cranert School, we ask them to identify these items that I'm going to ta be talking you through in a minute. Where do they think they stand today when they come into Cranert? Where do they believe they need to be two years from today to land that ideal job? And what do their experience and skills need to look like five years into their career so they get where they want to be? And so let's talk about each of them in a little bit of detail. It may look obvious, you know, what is your work experience? What jobs have you had? But I think about this from the perspective is what if you were creating your own personal web page? What experiences have you had either in the workplace or if you're relatively young in your career in extracurricular activities, team building in school or whatever, that can demonstrate that you are ready for the responsibilities associated with the job that you're interested in? And obviously, the farther you get along in your career, the, more, the longer that ought to be. But if you sit and think about and tie back to my earlier comment about in your resume, you want to make certain that you take a look at your experiences and what you're describing about yourself fitting in with where you want to be going in your career. Sit down and think about everything you have done work-wise and see what it does to lead you to your ultimate goal or what the hiring manager wants, or where you need to be five years down in your career, five years along in your career. Now, for students, obviously, we talk to them when they come in the door about their academic experience. For those of you out in the workplace who have been there for quite some time, um, academics are a little bit less important. Obviously, you want to be able to say you're a Purdue grad, whether it's an undergraduate degree or a graduate degree. But I guess the thing, only thing to think about this, are there items outside that you need to do to keep yourself fresh? Or if you need to be a CPA or if you need to be a CFA or whatever, even if you've been working for a long period of time, I would not make light of academic experience. I would make certain that you have some idea that you're keeping yourself up to date and educated in your field. The third area is global experience. Now, a few of us may end up in roles with firms that are not uh, globally involved, 
But it's hard for me to imagine today many work opportunities that don't need to have you think globally. I mean, we all are tracking the stock market and know that Greece is impacting our retirement plans. I teach an international finance course periodically, and I tell students, you can tell me that you are working in a company that produces its product locally and sells it locally, and then tell me that you don't need global experience. But if your competition imports their product from Mexico and sells against you competitively, you need to understand foreign exchange risk and you need to think globally. So as you think about your global experience, have you traveled the world? Uh, have you learned about other cultures? Do you have a sense of how the international economic, political, and cultural uh, situation impacts your career or business? Or have even better, have you lived globally or uh, internationally and can build on that to make yourself a better applicant? Fourth area is teamwork. I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. I can't imagine working in hardly any firm today where success is not dependent upon teamwork. Um, reflecting back on my own career, I would suggest that some of my senior managers thought less about my ability as a strategic planner and were more concerned about the teamwork that we participated in in my shop. Fifth area is social responsibility, and I would not make light of this. You know, mo many of us have been doing volunteer work in not-for-profit or agencies and things like that, or we are concerned about green, or we concerned about the reputation of the country, or things like that. But for me, as a hiring manager, I'm interested in that to make certain that you'll fit in with the culture. But also, too, I'm sure if you have served on not-for-profit boards or worked in areas like that, that you haven't heard this comment, if you want to get something done, give it to somebody that's busy. And so as I assess people to hire or recruiters assess people to hire, part of the reason they want to know that you are socially responsible or you do a lot of volunteer work, it meets that item that if you want, you want to get something done, give it to somebody that's busy. Now, those are the experience areas, but obviously you always want to be building your skills. And so as you think about getting to where, where you are today by comparison to where you want to go in your career, what leadership experiences you, do you need to have? And leadership isn't only managing 500 people. It can be driving change. It can be implementing a new major program in a firm. And it's very key, obviously. Uh, to any recruiter and I think important for your leadership ability. And then just simply your trade skills. As you work yourself through your career, what, a, what knowledge do you have if you're in finance? Have you learned how your firm runs its net present value calculations? If you're in, uh, the, uh, in the technical industry, how does R&D fit with all of that? What experiences and knowledge do you have to, to reach a senior level? And think about how you're going to build that on your career. Now, finally, we're talking about where are you in your career today relative to skills and experience. But the key point is where do you need to be five years from now to get to where you want to be? And when we talk about networking, from my perspective, that is the number one objective of all your networking conversations. When you talk to people, have them explain to you where they've been in their career, where they see their career going. And if they don't have a career that emulates what you want or is in your area, have them at least provide their perspective on the basis you need to touch, be they experiential or in, in, or in skills, to get to where you want to be. And as I said before, I'll talk that a little bit more in a second when we talk about developing your networking plan. Now, secondly, let's talk about the 10-year goal. 
And, and this is sort of a, you know, a, a tired statement. Careers are marathons are not sprints and not sprints. But I think this is really important that everyone needs to think about where do they want to be long term in their career? What are things that they need to do in the short term to get there? And might they be taking on responsibilities that are less fun or something they don't want to do? If, the end, if it helps them get to the end in mind. The other comment I would make on this is don't let anyone tell you they had no idea where they were going, just let it happen. They're kidding you. Even if they didn't sit down and write about it, I am sure they had some dreams in mind of where they would like to be. Or when they got an opportunity that came that was a surprise to them, that they didn't immediately sit down and think, what can I do in this role to advance myself even farther? Now, I will guarantee you that a large percentage of people, if they sit down today and say, where do they want to be from 10 years from now, they won't get it exactly right. But it is far easier to, te to work off a base that you're familiar with when there are bumps in the road or when different opportunities come along than if you haven't sat down and thought about where you want to go. I've had a number of situations where I have been managing careers of people relatively young in their career and they've been around long enough that they should be promoted one level in the organization but all of a sudden we find out oops they didn't have an experience they needed to get there and it's going to require another two-year job. It, it, it's almost pitiful because had they have sat down and planned their career a little bit more intelligently, the problem might not have taken place. Now, ways to get there, I think, are a little bit indirect, but uh, something that you should think about. When I interview, I never ask the question about where do you want to be in five or ten years. What I do is I say, does someone have a lifestyle that you would like to emulate? Is it a mentor? Is it a friend of the family? Is it someone you've worked for? Is it someone you've met in a uh, social circle? And think about what social circles are they running in? What is their role in the community? How has their significant other's career impacted theirs? What have they been thinking through about their children as it relates to their career? And I think that is as import, almost as important as, in, in identi as identifying the job so that you can think about where you want to go. I had a student once who I asked the first question, which was, tell me a little bit about your lifestyle and what you want to do. And the response was, work-life balance is important to me. Then I asked, well, what do you want to be doing in your career? And the answer was, I want to be an investment banker. I would suggest we have a problem, and I don't see those major mistakes frequently. But I do find a number of people have career aspirations that don't tie with the kind of lifestyle they want and how they want to work. Ask yourself, what title do you want to want? Do you have to be president? Do you have to be CFO? Do you have to be CIO, CFO? Or do you just care you have responsibility? How many people do you want to have working for you? Do you want to manage a staff of 500? Or do you not like managing people and say, hey, I want to just be a consultant and be an expert in some area? Do I want to be a part of a big company? Do I want to be part of a small company? Very practically, how many hours do you want to work? Do you want to work 40 hours a week when you're 40 or 50 years old? Do you want to work 70? How much traveling do you want to be doing? Will you live internationally? And I jokingly say to the students, Frankfurt and London don't count. Are you willing to live in Bangkok? Are you willing to live in Sao Paulo? Are you willing to live in Taipei? Are you willing to live in Moscow? Be very, very honest with yourself about whether or not you're willing to do that and how that fits into your career. If there were ever one area where being flexible can increase your chances for promotability in a career, I would say this is it. If you have to go to one of two or three towns, 
you may very well have missed some opportunities because you're willing to go to some unique place in the world that nobody else is willing to go to and it could mean you get promoted earlier than anyone else or later on in your career someone will be impressed by that experience or remember hey John or Jane Doe were willing to step out and do something out of the norm to help the company. And think about how many companies you're going to work for. Uh, are you going to be that very rare circumstance where you're going to work for one all of your career? Are you going to work for three? Are you going to work for five? Or are you going to work for ten? But sit down and understand and think to yourself, pardon me, what the answers to these questions are and how does it fit in. The final thing I would say in this area is, is your career goal consistent with your answers to these questions? Be very, very honest with yourself and assess where you stand academically if you're young in your career by comparison to your peers. Where do your leadership stand? And if you're later in your career, how does your rating within the firm compare with those who are your peers? When I was in industry, I used to drive senior managers crazy because I shared too much with my people, but I think it really helped them. And I did it in two ways. After we would have rating sessions, if, a, if one of my employees would ask me where they're rated, are they a 1, 2, 3, or 4, what percent are they, I would tell them exactly where they stood. And I used to joke that if you ran into people in the hall and said, where do you rate by comparison to your peer, uh, peers, I would bet 75% say the top half. Well, 25% have made a mistake, and they may not be able to make a fair assessment of where they want to be going in their career. So if you don't know, ask somebody and learn to be very honest with yourself. Don't be a C student with low entry level scores and think you're going to work for the Boston Consulting Group. Those are my comments on goals and on the 10 year goal. And I would suggest that you spend some time on this and spend time on it, walk away from it, and spend some time on it again. To a very great extent, this is a 24 by 7 proposition. And the extent to which you can run into people at any point in time and learn more about them and learn more about yourself for a good goal, I, would, I think you'll be much happier and have a much more successful career. Now the final area I want to talk about is networking. And when I accepted this role as Director of Career Services about three years ago, I called a friend of mine up who was an executive recruiter and the first three words out of his mouth were networking, networking, networking. So from a very practical standpoint, do you know how to make a LinkedIn connection? Do you know how to write an introductory email? Do you know how to handle an introductory phone call? And do you ha know how to do an uh, informational interview or even set up an informational interview? To some people, this is very natural, and it comes along without any problem. For many of us, it's a challenge, because it's just, it may not be intuitive. But let me make these suggestions for good informational interviews and interactions. When you're talking to this person that you want to learn some information from, they are the center of attention. How did you join the career? Or pardon me, how did you join the firm? What roles have you had while you're in the firm? Where do you see your career going? Tell me about situations in your career where there have been bumps in the road. You've had to make decisions about whether or not to take an international assignment or take an assignment that has you travel a lot at a key point in your children's development. Have you had a situation where there was a role you particularly wanted and it didn't come available? Have you been asked to take a role that you weren't interested in but were told that it was in the best long-term interest of the career? 
you will learn an awful lot back to my point about where you want to be five years or ten years down the road in your career. But you will put the person at ease and all of us by our very nature enjoy talking about ourselves. As I said before, networking and doing informational interviews in my mind are an absolute must for developing your career strategy. And in just a second I'll talk to you a little bit more about how you sh how I would su suggest that you as uh, where you assess in going out and talking to people. The other thing, every time you talk to a person I would suggest that you ask them to give you the names of another couple of people to talk to. So I decide I want to go into a role in finance at a firm and I get a hold of the CFO there. I would say, do you have another couple of people in your firm that I should talk to? Maybe people younger in their careers that could talk to me about getting in the firm or where I should be going with my career. Or do you have a peer in another firm that you believe would be appropriate for me to talk to? You are successful in an, in an uh, informational interview even if you do not find out whether or not they're hiring or even if you don't lead your resume. I would suggest in your first contact the closest you should get to asking a job or selling yourself is to say, hey, I have this sort of background, I have this work experience, I have these interests, here's where I think I'm going with my career. Do you agree or do you have suggestions on where you think I ought to go or experiences or skills I ought to pick up to get to where I want to go? If you want to take a look at key mistakes people make and really turn folks off, is if they go very early into the conversation and say, are you recruiting? Will you take or look at my resume? That's a surefire way to make certain that you won't have a successful uh, informational interview or gain much information. Now, the networking process. We work with a guy by the name of Steve Dalton, who is the associate director and senior career consultant at the Fuqua School at Duke. And he has what he calls is a two-hour job search that he calls LAMPS. List, alumni, motivation, position, sort. Here's what he has students do in a two-hour session. List your favorite 40 or 50 companies. I would suggest you can do this in your own career even if you're 40 or 50 years old. Make it 40 or 50. Then, uh, are there alumni or other contacts in those companies that are the potential for you to talk to and have an informational interview? Once again, you're not asking them to review your resume and you're not asking them whether you're, they're going to hire you. You want to understand more about them. You want to understand about the firm and at most ask them for some career advice. Then you go through those 40 or 50 companies and you rate each. That's your motivation. Do I really, is this a large dynamic firm that is uh, fortune top 25 and I want to be a part of it and it's a one? If I'm really driven by smaller firms and startups, does this really fit in and it's a one? Does this firm have a culture that I want to be a part of? Does this firm create a terrific bullet point on my resume? Go through and rate each firm from one to five. And do it really rapidly. Do it off, principally off your gut feel. Then go to their websites and see whether or not they're hiring. In the world we live in today, a very large percentage of jobs are posted there. And so you can get a sense of whether or not there's an opportunity available. Or at a minimum, you can get a sense of the type of people they're looking for, experience-wise, education-wise, or where, where around the world they're going to be hiring people. 
after you've done that exercise um, and rated the websites, rank once again between one on five on the possibility that they're out hiring. And then finally, in the LAMPS approach, get yourself down to 20 firms. Now, you've identified 20 firms you're interested in. Step one is to identify 20 people that you want to meet. You can do that through a LinkedIn search. You can do it through a Google search. You can think, well, I know somebody personally, has a fellow alum work there, somebody you know from your personal experience. Um, it could be somebody you met earlier in your career. But you want to find 20 people to meet you in, uh, that you would like to meet, one in each firm. Then you want to sit down and think, OK, if I contact this individual, what information do, want I, do I want to gather from talking to them? I.e., what's the purpose of the contact? Do you want to understand if they are in information systems and you're interested in sales, what you may be interested in is how does this firm hire people? What are typical career progressions there? What's the roles of the sales organization in their firm? If you want to be in information session uh, or in information systems, you might want to ask them what are key roles, responsibility, experiences, and skills that they see as being a priority for being successful in the firm. Then you need to figure out how you're going to reach them. Are you going to try to ask them to be a LinkedIn contact? Are you going to do a cold telephone call? Are you going to try to find their email and send them an introductory email, but identify how you can reach them? After you've talked to this people, back to our point before about informational interviews, when you talk to them, ask them to give you two more people to talk to. So if you think about from Cranert, we're all good with numbers. You go through the list of 20. They give you two more. You're at 60. One of the guys we use here for advising our students in career development says that you need to contact 100 people to get a job. So I would suggest that if you're getting tired or it feels like a lot of work, but you're below 50, you ought to force yourself to work harder at that. And if at all possible, don't stop until you reach 100 contacts. One other thing. If a firm falls off your list, replace it. Don't you get yourself in a situation there are only two or three firms that I would like to work for and focusing print solely on those. You want to keep all your opportunities open, and you never really know where that right role may just fall out of the heavens. So that's my story and what I hope is helpful in your career, and I'd be willing to take any questions if you have any. But as a reminder, what we call the big four here at Cranert, and you will not get a master's degree from Cranert any longer unless you have a resume that's approved, a graded interview, a networking plan, and a career strategy. We believe those are very, very important. And we also believe that from a competitive standpoint, doing that with our students will help move them to the head of the class by comparison to their competition at other schools. Roger, thank you for that great information and what you do with career services. Again, if uh, the folks who are uh, tuning into this webinar live, we still have time to take some questions. So if you want to type those in in the lower left-hand corner, we do have some questions. And I want to go back to the resume part of this. You have, I'm sure, in this current role, and in your past life seen hundreds if not thousands of resumes. Is there a particular phrase or a particular aspect of a resume that catches your attention in either a positive or negative way? In other words, is there a phrase that you absolutely do not ever want to see on a resume that crosses your desk? Or is there something that you would like to see more often? Good, Tim. Um, I like to see action verbs kick it off delivered this, processed this. As I said before, I want to see outcomes. I don't want to hear that you were in the finance club. I don't want to hear you're the president of the finance club. I want to hear you're the vice president of the finance club and you talked Warren Buffett into coming to Purdue University. 
Another suggestion I would make, there are a lot of keywords like leadership, team working, and things like that that play very r real well on resumes. It's 2011. There are a lot of resume reviews that are being done mechanistically rather than individuals reviewing them. As you pull your resume together, I would read the job descriptions of where you're applying and pick the words in that job description and put them in my resume. That's a very good way to get it pulled out of a stack of a thousand people that are applying for a job. I guess the final thing I would say in this is students are really bad at this using acronyms, but I also find people later in their career using acronyms. Have someone who is not in the firm you work for, who is really an outsider, review your resume and see if it makes sense to them and is understandable. All right, the next question is, um, you, and, and let me throw in first, I'll give you your voice a little break. Um, I want to throw a commercial in because you just talked about the fact that you want to see action and see what students have done. We actually had another one of our alums, Rick Smith, who's the CEO at Equifax, uh, say that he would prefer to hire an A- minus or a B student with accomplishments on the resume that demonstrate teamwork and, and uh, getting out and doing something rather than a straight-A student who did nothing. So people can see that resume. This is the commercial part uh, on our website. At, at that, they can watch that, uh, that video and, and have Rick talk about the resumes that he likes at www.cranert.purdue.edu. You Thank, talk Thank you, and congratulations, Rick Smith. I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. See, Rick put that Cranert education to very good use. There are so many ways right now to contact a potential employer, and this is where technology comes in. Are some more frowned upon or more favored? Uh, you talked about you can get through to people through LinkedIn, through email, through phone, through snail mail. From an etiquette standpoint, from a corporate etiquette standpoint, is there something that you like to see more or something that you don't like to see? Uh, in 2011, if you are not on LinkedIn, and you don't look at that as your major job search online uh, opportunity for getting a hold of people, you're making a very big mistake. I didn't talk it here, but I would consider reviewing your LinkedIn page and spending almost as much time on it as you do on your resume because it is the top priority. Many executive recruiters start their search on LinkedIn. As a recruiter and getting information on somebody from the outside, I find somebody asking to be my contact to be a little bit less or much less invasive than a telephone call, an email, or snail mail. Now, that's not saying I wouldn't do those. Pardon me, but I would say that it is a much more relaxed method to get at that. The other thing is, though, make certain when you ask for a contact, you use that as an opportunity not to just check the box of what type of contact they are, but use that as an opportunity to have the person in the firm understand why you want to get a hold of them and information you'd like to talk about. Would you be willing to have a 15-minute phone call with me? Could we exchange emails or whatever? I guess the final point I'd make on this, nothing is wrong, but LinkedIn's where it's at today. And you need to assess yourself how at ease are you making phone calls or things like that. I guess the one final comment I would make is many of us on this phone call are Purdue alums, and by our very nature, we are much more conservative and laid back than many graduates from other schools. And so get out of your comfort zone a bit and be willing to try something different. Roger, earlier on you touched about getting outside feedback from people. Uh, a lot of people who are watching this webinar either have had, will have, or currently have mentors, personal mentors. How do you get them involved in this whole process of the, of the job networking and, and interviewing and, and all of the things that you talked about earlier? Well, I, I have a whole bunch of comments on this, and I'll try to keep it brief. First off, your career is very, very important, and it's a 24 by 7 process. 
And so you should always be open to the fact that someone you're talking to could be providing you some information about what a successful career looks like, potential good contacts, or whatever the case could be. It could be the person you're sitting next to at the basketball game, someone you met at a cocktail party on Saturday night, or whatever the case might be. If you're in a firm, you should push your boss, if you haven't found a mentor, to help you find one. And also, don't hesitate if someone assigns you a mentor or you try it out and it doesn't work to get a different one. This is a personality type of thing. It's uh, and also very personal. And so you need to make certain that it really works for you. I guess the final thing I would say on this is I would reference one of our very successful fellow alums, Susan Butler. She wrote a book called The CEO of You, Inc. And in it, she talks about identifying mentors. And the premise of the book is to find mentors that are going to be your board of directors. You're the CEO of that board. And what people can you be talking to that can help you get to where you want to be in your career? Uh, Susan, you're welcome, but I would recommend her book very highly. And, and I'm sure that residual check will be coming to you very shortly. There are probably some people watching this, Roger, that, that may be currently unemployed. How do you honestly communicate that in this job search process without making yourself look like a questionable candidate? It's a really good question, Tim. Um, I can tell you what not to do. If you're unemployed or really concerned about landing a job, the biggest mistake you can make is leading people to believe or saying you'll take anything or you're looking at a broad set of opportunities. First, that makes you look hard up. And secondly, it's counterintuitive. But in this type of market, you need to line up perfectly with what the recruiter is looking for to get a job. In a market where you're getting a lot of opportunities, if where you say you want to go doesn't line up with a recruiter, they might try to convince you to alter your career expectations so that they can hire you. In this type of market, they are only interested in you if you are a perfect match. And if you aren't that perfect match, they'll go to candidate number two. So it's counterintuitive, but it's even more important in this type of market to be specific. So you don't want to sound hard up, and you want to say, hey, this is what I'm looking for, and be very, very positive about it. Final question I have here. Um, when, and we didn't touch a lot because we've done something before on interviewing, but when you're sitting face to face, and you've done this again hundreds if not thousands of times, personality, you, you, you've got the resume, the person's going to try to tell you what his or her skills are. From a personality standpoint, how much of that should be, should any of it be kept in check? In other words, I'm a very outgoing person, but I feel like this is a very serious interview. How much do I have to gear down? And on the flip side, if I'm a very quiet person, but the person I'm sitting across the table from is high octane, do I have to change my demeanor during the interview? That's a difficult question because it's very qualitative. But I would start out by this. The most important thing is to be yourself. It gets back to my previous point that you don't want to mislead somebody or give them the sense that you are acting to get the job. They ought to know you as you are. Then the second thing I think is I would take my lead from the type of person you're interviewing with. If they are casual, I wouldn't be as casual as they are, but I would tend towards that. If they are very matter-of-fact, very specific. I would be very specific when I answer their questions. Um, another personal experience, I love college basketball. 
And when I got my first job at Procter & Gamble, those were the Johnny Wooden days. And one of the guys I interviewed was a UK grad and also loved college basketball. In my hour interview, we talked college basketball for 45 minutes, and he kind of looked at me and said, oops, Roger, I need to ask you some questions. I got the job. So the most important thing here is, I think, take the lead by the person interviewing you. And I would be careful not to be as casual as they are. And I guess the other thing I would say, you are on stage every minute whether you're at a dinner, a lunch, even if they tell you you're going to lunch or dinner with somebody that's not on the interview team, everybody's making notes and everybody's going to get on the phone after they talk to you and tell the hiring manager what they think. He is a finance guru, a career services expert, a college basketball junkie, and an all-around great guy. Roger, we thank you very much not only for your time, but also for the information you shared with us today. Thank you, very Thank you very much, and it is truly my pleasure to work with one Tim Newton. He is a real great Cranert person. Thanks a lot, Tim. And that residual check will be in the mail as well. Uh, that's all the time we have today for our webinar. Please check the Cranert website at www.cranert.purdue.edu for future editions. You can also follow the school on Twitter at Purdue Cranert. For Roger Stewart, I'm Tim Newton. Thank you very much for tuning in.